I'm Paul Davies. I'm director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. So are you a big wheel? Uh, little wheel, I think, <laughs> uh, in the context of Arizona State. Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Ah, yes, in my dreams. So this is an interesting uh, whole concept because I think the alien abduction stories are uh, in effect lucid dreams that people don't understand uh, that they are dreaming. So lucid dreaming is a uh, well-known phenomenon, it's much studied. Uh, I have studied it and in fact I have tried to induce lucid dreams. You can buy a face mask that flashes <laughs> lights in your eyes. Uh, <laughs> I bought this many years ago through New Scientists for 30 pounds. Uh, I thought, well, this looks pretty good, I'll give it a try. <laughs> uh, and it takes a bit of practice, but the, uh, the plan is that you're having normal, rather silly dreams, which people have all the time, sort of shapeless, formless, not very credible. Obviously, they are dreams. But, so you haven't read uh, Freud well, much then? Uh, I've read a bit, bit of Freud, but, <laughs> but, but, but the point is, why, and Jung as well, but once you realize you're dreaming, you can gain control over the dreams and turn it into a lucid dream. And then it becomes uh, just like, we are now, full technicolor and all of the senses including uh, the tactile senses because mostly in dreams uh, it has this sort of wishy-washy quality and you don't really feel pain or touch or anything like that, you're sort of floating around but in a lucid dream you get all that and so uh, dreams that combine lucidity with levitation, a feeling that you're floating or flying and the tactile sense of being touched or probed all add up, in my mind, to alien abduction. We always use informational language. Uh, if you talk to a biologist, you know, what is life? You'll be given a narrative in terms of things like uh, codes and transcription and translation and signals and all that sort of information speak. Talk to a chemist or a physicist, what is life? And you'll be given description in terms of entropy and energy and chemical affinities and thermodynamics. Uh, so we've got these two parallel narratives of life and somehow we have to join them together. And I think that the key to understanding how life began is really in the way that from some sort of complex network of chemical reactions, the way that the information was flowing around and stored in the system transformed to a distinctive type of pattern or motif. And what we're doing at Arizona State University is we're studying the informational patterns in known living systems, looking at things like gene regulatory networks. We've been looking at the cell cycle of yeast, but we're also looking at these, the uh, regulatory network that controls the uh, development of the sea urchin and one or two others. And what we are finding is that the pattern of information flowing around these systems uh, is very different from random. So we're thinking that there's a parallel story. We have the uh, origin of life. We can think of that as a sort of chemical climbing mountain probable, as Richard Dawkins will put it, that you have to get the right stuff. And bit by bit, through some sort of process of accident or e evolution or natural selection or some combination of things, uh, we go up and up uh, and up this mountain of complexity. But alongside that mountain of material complexity, there is also a mountain of informational complexity. And that's the one we're studying. It's been completely neglected so far. Tell us the most important things we know about the universe and the most important things we don't know about the universe. <laughs> well, uh, when I was a student, there was very little we did know about the universe, other than the fact that it was expanding and there was a sort of assumption it began with a Big Bang, and that was about it. Uh, uh, today, uh, cosmology has become a quantitative science, and so we know a lot of things really rather precisely. Uh, so we know quite a bit about uh, the initial state of the universe. It wasn't totally and completely smooth, as we were discussing a few moments ago. It had some sort of ripples or corrugations or irregularities imprinted on it, and that shows up in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The afterglow of the Big Bang has got these tiny variations, which over time grew to become clusters of galaxies. Uh, and so we can ask the question, where did those tiny variations come from? Uh, if you want me to, to lapse into religious language, why did God create the Big Bang with tiny ripples in it that would be needed for the emergence of galaxies at some later stage? Uh, can we attribute those ripples to a physical mechanism? And I think uh, the answer is uh, almost certainly yes. 
we can attribute it to quantum processes that took place in the very early universe, probably associated with the so-called inflationary epoch, where the universe leapt in size by some enormous factor in a tiny split second. Uh, those quantum processes are something I happened to work on myself back in the 1970s. Uh, and so uh, I like the idea that the reason that there are clusters of galaxies is because of these quantum variations that were uh, imprinted on the very early universe because of processes that took place in the first split second. We don't absolutely know that. There may be other reasons for it, but that's, uh, that's one of the things we'd like to know about. The other big mystery, of course, that everybody asks is what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, and that divides into two possibilities. One is that nothing happened before the Big Bang because it was the origin of time. Uh, that was the picture when I was a student. Nothing more to be said. Time began with the Big Bang. Uh, and the other is that there was something before the Big Bang, and we'd like to know what. And so in the multiverse picture I was just talking about, there is a sort of everlasting superstructure within which universes like ours pop up like bubbles, uh, scattered throughout space and time for all eternity. Uh, and so it's a very popular view. Uh, but we absolutely don't know, in our present state of observation or knowledge, whether the Big Bang was the ultimate origin of all physical things or just the beginning of a sort of localized bubble uh, that we call the universe, but is really only a tiny fragment of a much bigger system. Tell us about the post-detection committee that you are on or ahead, and uh, tell me, have you drawn up the uh, terms of the Treaty of Unconditional Surrender yet? Uh, right, so uh, this curious body, the uh, SETI post-detection task group, was set up many years ago by the International Academy of Astronautics. And it was a sort of motley collection of scientists and journalists and uh, some media people and a couple of lawyers and a priest. Um, and it had no budget, and so its deliberations were really rather limited. But its purpose was to reflect on what do we do, uh, not necessarily should ET make contact. I think that's the scenario everybody has in mind oh my God, we got the message, what do we do now? Who do we tell? Mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But really more, um, uh, supposing we uh, got incontrovertible evidence that we are not alone in the universe, you know, what next? Uh, and there are issues such as, well, if there is a particular location in the sky where we think there are other, uh, there's another civilization, let's put it that way, you know, should we just grab every available radio telescope and start beaming home, uh, homespun wisdom? To, to these uh, entities, uh, or should there be a bit more deliberation and control, uh, you know, and who calls the shots? So those were the sorts of things we thought about. I have to say that in recent years, uh, this task group uh, looks like it has sort of evaporated away. Uh, but the IAA has uh, convened a sort of parallel uh, group, and the, um, the SETI community, in any case, developed a protocol for how to deal with uh, in, in the event of a putative message many years ago. And, and it sets out some very obvious steps, like who you tell first and, and so forth. But you I think we, your friends. <laughs> well, well, you know, I think we all agree that uh, it wouldn't work out uh, on the day as advertised, because in these days of social media, it, it only takes, uh, you know, one, uh, one cleaner in the radio observatory to suspect there's something up. Uh, you know, to text her boyfriend and uh, okay. then it's in the New York Times. <laughs>